My mom is a teacher at our school, and then my dad's a crab fisherman. So. Oh, great. Great. It's good to meet you, Millie. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. Okay, Millie, I'm just going to go ahead and mute. Do you want to do your little sound check? A, B, C, one, two, three. Okay. Do we need to do your little uh, action thing, Amagissa? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think enough of this thing. I'm going to mute myself. Uh, Mr. Reichdahl, good luck. She's going to put you through the blender. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. Uh huh. Okay, ready? Please tell us your name, where you live, and your job. Yeah, I'm Chris Rakedell, State Superintendent of Schools. I live in Tumwater, Washington, but our offices are in the old Capitol Building in Olympia, Washington. Where did you go to elementary school? I went to Central Elementary School in the little town of Snohomish, Washington, northeast of Seattle. Do you have a funny story from elementary school or one of your favorite teachers that you remember? Well, my favorite teacher uh, was Mrs. Cruz. Um, I had her actually for fifth and sixth grade because she had a split class in fifth and um, just an awesome teacher who you just knew cared about us a ton. Um, it's not a funny story, but I did get in kind of a tussle, a fight on the playground with my very best friend. And she locked us in a room at the end of school and she said, you're not allowed to leave until you figured this out. And it took us like a half hour, 45 minutes, but she was definitely one of those teachers that tried to get us to see each other uh, in different ways and to recognize our conflict and to solve it and not let it fester. So I'm really grateful for her. Yeah. What are your favorite subjects in school? It changed over time. When I was in elementary school, uh, definitely math and anything science. Um, by high school, it was more social studies. And definitely in college, I really learned and appreciated writing skills and the power of communicating through written word. Um, and so it's definitely evolved over time. Uh, by the time I went to graduate school, though, I did a lot more quantitative work, so back into the math and all that. So I love them all, but math early, um, social studies in the middle of my life. I was a social studies teacher, um, but always a real appreciation for writing. Is, when you're younger, what jobs do you think you want to do when you got older? So I definitely want to be a teacher, which is what I did uh, when I first started my career. And I taught social studies, uh, interestingly. <laughs> um, and then I always said, I don't know what the next step will be. I never had some plan with you know, de detailed steps to what I want to do. But I always said it would be something in public service and almost always wanted it to be around supporting public education. So I've been really blessed to do the stuff that I thought I would do. I just I never really knew exactly what job that would be along the way. and I sort of let my hard work and my faith guide that stuff. Is there any advice you'd like to give to elementary age students? Um, don't be in too much of a hurry. Um, I would say to them that the world is a big and broad place and the pathways are many. And no matter where you sort of envision yourself in 10 or 20 years or what you are passionate about, you can find your way there. Even if you sidetrack and do something else for a while, it will give you experience to make you better at the thing you thought you would do. So I would say to every student, just laugh a lot and embrace the moment and every day is pretty precious. Um, and just have a confidence that you can always get to where you're going no matter what crazy path that you're on. There's no one right way. You went to Washington State University. Have you ever been to an Apple Cup game? Uh, I have, probably four of them in my time at WSU. Um, I can't recall every outcome, uh, but generally in those years, WSU would lose to the Huskies in Pullman, and we were beating the Huskies on the road in Seattle. So I was kind of a, it was kind of a mixed bag when I went. Um, and then after I left, things were quite good. And then for the last 10 years in Apple Cups, they've been absolutely terrible. But we hope to turn it around this year. After this pandemic has ended, where would you like to go on vacation? So I'm actually gonna try to get away a little bit in July, um, safe and social distancing by hiking parts of Zion National Park and Bryce Canyon National Park, which I've always wanted to go to. Um, but uh, I would, like so many, I definitely need to get away, but I'm trying to do it in a way that's really healthy and safe and be more outdoors about it. So. When you're driving on your vacation, which musician or music group from the state of Washington would you listen to? Oh, that's an awesome question. From the state of Washington, well, here's the deal. I am sort of never evolved out of the 80s, so I love my 80s music, particularly pop music. 
So it will have this beautiful mix once in a while of hearts, a wonderful band uh, who mostly uh, played in the 80s and early 90s out of Seattle and one of the first sort of uh, female, all female early rock groups of pop music. And so some heart will be mixed in there. That's about the best I can do. My college era was grunge, so it was very much about Nirvana. Um, it was very much about that scene, which I didn't really appreciate when I was in college, but as I've gotten older, I've liked the music more. But no, it'll be full of 80s music, so mostly heart. If you are in politics and education, what job would you see yourself doing? Stand-up comedy or acting or both. How social distancing affected you? Um, so I think in a lot of ways, like all of us, um, there is no substitute for interacting with people. And so with my own family, my nuclear family, of course, we're at home. So I still get to hug my kids and embarrass my kids and, and all that, which I really uh, still love to do. But there's also just a need to be in space with people, even at work where you see that, like in a meeting where you see their emotional response to something, you see the inflection. Of their, of their face or expressions, you hear their voice change. There's a subtlety around how I think human beings understand each other. And this flat screen, two-dimensional thing at a distance, um, it's better than not having it at all, but it is no substitute for that sort of interaction with each other. And we're a very social creature, I think. And I, I miss just that general, simple human interaction at work for sure. Did you have to work at home for a while? Well, definitely more than I did, um, but mostly in the evenings and weekends from home, uh, we've identified our essential personnel here at this, at this office building. And so there's only a couple of us that are still uh, in the building, but um, I'm mostly working from my office still, but mostly very alone. What have been the challenges? The pace of decision-making <clears throat> um, in a crisis, particularly on the front end, you make a lot of decisions and you wish you had more information, but you you make the decision with the best information you have, but everything takes longer. Uh, when you can just walk down the hall and say, hey, let's figure this out, and you solve it in two minutes, and then you each, you know, go your own way, that's different than we need to schedule a Zoom meeting, and let's make sure it works in your calendar, and then let's have our meeting, and then let's follow up. I feel like technology allows us to connect, but I think in some ways it's very inefficient for how long it takes us to create those engagements. And so, even though we've had a lot of decisions to make, I don't think systems are very good about making them this way. So it causes more hours. Uh, I normally work 40, 45 hours a week, but during the crisis, so I'm easily 55 to 60 hours a week, and sometimes more. What is something that you've learned from this experience? Well, I think re reaffirmed um, the preciousness of life and that, um, every day is a moment to cherish and, and be blessed by, which is why, you know, I said it'd be a, comedian or an actor because I've always found a way to laugh even in very tough times and I've had enough tragedy in my life to to know you have to laugh and um, find humor in things and so I've reaffirmed just how important um, we are to each other and social distancing makes that harder and we have lost 108,000 Americans um, as a result of this at a minimum and you know almost 1200 Washingtonians have died from this disease and so the preciousness of life and just really appreciating the gift that we have every day and uh, I've learned that you, even in tough times, have to find reasons to laugh and find joy and, and see the beauty that's all around us. What have you done to keep yourself busy? Uh, um, uh, work mostly. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of work time to get through some really complicated decision making. Um, but I've also forced myself to sit down and watch some Netflix, which I never really did. There was like one series or two series in the last several years that I ever watched, but I, I found other things to get into, mostly to just sort of escape and check out of the work world and reset my mind at night. And then lots of walks with the family and the dog. And so I'm trying to get some exercise in as well, uh, but it's very different than, than it used to be. Yeah. Since you're in charge of all the schools in the state of Washington, describe the challenges you and your office have had during this pandemic. Yeah, I think the challenges are, are trying to get answers to people um, when they want them fast, even though we don't have all the information um, that, that is ideal. And there's always this really interesting balance. Uh, it happens in every state, but especially ours, where people want answers from us, but they don't want to be told what to do. Right, Each school district is its own legal entity and it has its own school board and I really honor that. I really want those locally elected officials 
to be able to make answers, um, uh, solutions that make the most sense for their community. But sometimes, particularly in crisis, things centralize and people want central answers uh, because let's face it, if you're talking about life and death issues of a virus, there really shouldn't be 295 different ways to approach that. So when it came to the health and the safety, those decisions became very central. But now that we're working on reopening schools, we can get back to local decision making with a lot more flexibility, assuming we can do it all in a very healthy and safe way this fall. How much have you had to work with Governor Inslee during these hard times? A lot in the beginning. Again, he was making really complicated decisions for our whole state, um, for all the sectors of the economy, not just education. But he was very gracious to bring me into a lot of that consideration around schools, uh, especially early on. So as we navigated the unknown of the virus and all of the unknown around schools, we worked a lot together on that. Ultimately, all 50 states closed their schools. Um, so we were um, right there with the rest of them. Then he's got a lot of other stuff he has to deal with. And so I've been able to dive uh, back into my world of education and really try to support school districts through this. Um, but, but quite a bit of work with the governor on the front end. And then we'll re-engage quite a bit uh, on our thinking about reopening schools so that we're really on the same page about that. Would you ever consider running for governor someday? Um, not right now. Uh, I'm the superintendent of schools and and uh, that's what matters to me the most. And like I said in my earlier answer, I've always known the work I want to do, which is public service, and, and it has to have a focus on education. Uh, that's what's really passion. That's my passion. And I've never worried through what those steps would be. Um, I could have been a school teacher for 30 years and loved the work. I did want to do more policy work, and I didn't think I could get that done in the classroom. So um, I could go everywhere from returning to a classroom or higher education um to you know another political step but i kind of don't really worry about those until those opportunities um, create themselves i mostly just focus on the service side of it um, but again if a stand-up comedy gig opens up with enough pay i'll think about that for sure uh and then my family were all builders growing up so there are parts and there are times in my life where i've been able to remodel uh, or build things and i love that i love putting my mind to work in totally different ways so who knows what the next step will be how do you think this is how do you think this experience is going to change education going forward? Well, I think it's made us really aware of how important school is, not just because that's where we get our primary learning, but there's a lot of supports at school that get lost in a distance model. And there's a lot of interaction between students. And we don't quantify that learning, but as a sixth grader yourself, if you really think about it, a lot of what you've learned about relationships and about the world we live in and about understanding differences didn't come out of a textbook. It came with interacting with your colleagues. So I think we've relearned how important that is, but then there'll be some changes for a long time. I, I think this technology option needs to be there all the time in better ways. And clearly some families weren't able to connect. And so we've got to double down on that and figure it out. And I think the way we grade might change in the future, um, personally. Um, I like the idea of getting away from Fs, for example. If a student doesn't have mastery of a subject, then let's figure out ways to get them mastery and not let the calendar drive us to some cliff where we eventually say, well, there's just no hope there on that one. Let's give them an F. Let's figure out ways to get them to understand what we think is really the core learning. So there's a lot of things that could change out of this. Um, I think more students by high school are gonna be taking dual credit options with their colleges or universities. And then, um, uh, yeah, we're gonna hopefully simplify how many different learning standards we have because we literally have hundreds of them. And in a time of crisis, it was obvious we needed to focus on just the absolute essentials in each subject area. And so hopefully we'll have some permanent and forever transformation out of this. I interviewed Joyce Taylor from King 5 TV earlier. One of her concerns is student access and there's disparity in learning between schools, school districts, and even states. If some schools can't open normally in the fall and have to use a distant learning model, what can state do to help the students have equal access to learning? Well, we are definitely trying to work on a traditional fall open. And by traditional, I mean face to face, but with lots of social distancing requirements, probably masks, maybe screening, health screenings. So we're definitely trying to get back to that system that we think is more effective. But if we are still in a distance model in some regions, 
then what we're trying to do is create hotspot capacity for families uh, who are in very rural places. And we are actually trying to purchase a year's worth of uh, broadband connectivity for families who are in a serviceable area but haven't been able to afford the connection. And then there's an entire side of this that is on our educators' side where they have to continue to get better and better about teaching at a distance if they find themselves back in that, in that reality. So there's a lot of work to do this summer to get ready, but our hope is that it will be virtually all school districts can open this fall um, with social distancing, but, but face to face again. My mom is a teacher at our school. Do you have any advice for teachers? Uh, take a deep breath is my first bit of advice. Um, teachers are remarkable, as you know, and they put a lot of load on their own shoulders about the success of the, of the young people that they educate. And there's a reason they chose that profession. They see the value in that and they see the, they see the enormous need for it. But sometimes that can be really overwhelming for a teacher to take the full responsibility of the success of a kid or a family on their shoulders. And so uh, my advice is to balance that. Yeah, we're in pretty weighty jobs that mean a lot to families, but we can't solve every economic injustice or every racial injustice or every technology injustice just in our classrooms. We have to put our best foot forward, take ownership of what we control, and take a deep breath and understand that we're part of systems that need transformation. And every teacher shouldn't own every single one of those uh, burdens on their own. And, and, and the teachers that balance that well, I think have really successful careers and, and those who try to take too much, they really under a lot of duress and, and sometimes they kind of burn themselves out. You like pickles? No. I don't think there's anything in the world that's better pickled than in its raw state, whether it's beans or, or cucumbers or anything. I don't like anything pickled. What would you choose, pizza or hamburgers? Pizza, every time. I love pizza. Yeah. I saved one of the biggest questions for you for the end. Were you able to find more toilet paper after you suggested that we should be toilet paper kind and you said a spare square? Yes, and wasn't it amazing that if we just took some time and relaxed and didn't hoard it, that eventually the paper products industry would catch up and get us what we needed, and ultimately they did. You know what's still hard to find, though, is cleaning agents. Like People want hand wipes and sanitizers and stuff for their houses. Um, I've checked multiple grocery stores just to sort of understand that dynamic, and boy, those were a lot harder for industry to now backfill, but the paper process is all good. Everyone take a deep breath. We're good to go. And somewhere in, in this state of ours, there are families with like five year supplies of toilet paper. So, yeah. Since we live in a small community, would you like to give any advice to the graduating class of 2020? Yeah. First, a thank you to them for being incredibly flexible in uncertain times. Uh, but mostly, my advice comes from the old history teacher in me that is reminded that there's been generations who have struggled mightily like this one in terms of normalcy. Right? This wasn't normal by any stretch. It can break us if we feel like we're victims to it and we're frustrated, or it can make us stronger if we say that was really a bummer. But this is what I learned about resiliency, and flexibility, and caring, right? <clears throat> the reason why so many of us sacrificed our traditional systems this year was to make sure that we didn't get a virus that we could you know, impact our grandparents with. I mean, let's face it. Folks who are dying from this are primarily over the age of 80, increasingly over the age of 65, but we did this together. We sacrificed together. So to the graduating seniors, um, there's a bright future ahead of them. It, it didn't look normal this year, but they were also part of something that is quite beautiful, which is an entire society making a sacrifice to their routine to try to better protect the health of some of their fellow citizens, including their own family members. And that's pretty cool. So lead with sacrifice all the time. Those are all the questions I have for you, but that was very fun. Thank you. Thank you. Those are awesome questions. Great to be on ONN. <laughs> all right, Millie. I unmuted myself because that was our agreement, right? Yep. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Mr. Reichdahl. Thank you. Great stuff. Thank you very much. Now, the other, last question I have for you is um, some of the other people that have inter we've interviewed um, they've asked for a copy of the recording. Would you want me to send a copy of this to your office? 
Um, we don't need it. Um, we, we don't need it, need it. But if you want us to have it uh, for the old archives, we certainly can. But um, if it's extra work for you all, then just plow ahead. These are tough times and we don't need it. Okay. Okay. It's not a problem on our end, but we, we thought we should ask. <laughs>